eight common Zionist talking points and how to respond. And we're not going to go through this argument again, but just to just to reiterate out there, everyone, Zionist does not equal Jew. In fact, there are more Zionists, Zionists who, are not Jewish. who are not Jewish than there are Jews in the world. And there are many anti-Zionist Jews like the two you're watching right now. So when you hear the word Zionist, do not think Jewish people and don't use the word Zionist to mean Jewish people. Um, so I, again, there's, uh, there's a lot you can read here and y'all watching can see the Instagram account for those listening. Uh, it is at R A A D B A R H O U S H. That's the Instagram user's account. And basically I thought it was a really, a really nice and more succinct way to deal with a lot of the questions, either questions that come up in a legitimate conversation or questions you get from trolls. And so uh, the, the, they're also split up into ones that pertain to recent events specifically and ones that pertain to the, the cause of Palestinian freedom in general. So the first one is Israel has the right to defend itself after the Hamas attacks of October 7th. So the, Sam Husseini already brought this up. As an occupying force, you don't have a right to defend yourself not legally and also not morally, but you don't have to start with that. Um, uh, although <laughs> he does, <laughs> uh, basically the idea that he also brings up in this post is what does it mean to defend oneself? We have a department of defense in this country. We haven't defended ourselves against shit since the advent of this country, right? We are an offensive force. Right. The empire is an offensive force. Israel is an offensive force. It is an occupying force. It it uh, exports violence, right? <laughs> so there is no defense that we're talking about here. When you come in and you steal people's land, there is no defense in that. That is not a defensive action. Uh, the second point that... Uh, that that he that he brings up is quote why would Hamas attack Israel knowing the consequences of their actions? So uh, he brings up the PLO accepted all U.S. and Israeli conditions for peace and signed the Oslo Peace Accord in 1993 in return for an end to Israeli occupation. Thirty years passed and the Palestinians regained nothing. On the contrary, Israel occupied more land, built more settlements, increased military presence, and violated holy sites. Uh, he also brings up the Great March of Return, which was a way to again peacefully, like the like, literally have tried everything, peacefully marching. A lot of elders holding the keys uh, to their homes that were destroyed or that they were thrown out of during the Nakba in 1948. So this this way of of fighting back, uh, of of peacefully showing up for protests, BDS, et cetera, et cetera, appealing to the global community, tried all of it. Nothing helped. Nothing's happened. And in fact, they were murdered during the Great March of Return. Right. Thousands were shot. Uh, Two hundred some were killed. And these are unarmed, innocent people walking towards a fence that is illegal under international law. So with all of this, the question then becomes, are we surprised that Hamas didn't do this sooner, actually? Because if you look at the history of this, the history of the oppression and the violence, I'm actually surprised that this has not happened sooner. And again, this is not about whether I think that I, I enjoy seeing uh, civilians, regardless of whether what, what passport they have or what flag they fly, do I enjoy them seeing them die? No, I don't. Again, this has to do with contextualizing the situation so we understand where this is coming from. Uh, do, you know, do, would I enjoy seeing a bunch of uh, a bunch of people murdered by indigenous peoples in here or in South America or wherever? No, I would enjoy watching it. But if you understand the context of what's happening, then you understand the actions that took place. The next point that uh, he brings up is, uh, quote, Israel completely withdrew from Gaza, therefore it's not occupied. I actually don't know who the hell says this because I would just love to know. I, I don't think I've heard that one. What? Where is that talking point? Yeah. Um. So the point that I guess he's pulling from a comment that Israel just uh, withdrew Israeli settlers from Gaza uh, in 2005, but 
of course, as we know, um, as we've said many times, it is Gaza is known as the largest open air prison in the world. And therefore, the idea that Israel has withdrawn from it is, is well, laughable. And, it's like and, saying that the that that the cops have withdrawn from the prisons. It's like, what? I, what? Right, right, right. It, it, the cop's not in your prison yeah, cell, so you're free there. So you're free in your prison cell. Uh, but on top of the fact that they have them in prison, so they can't leave. Yes, yeah, some Gazans get a pass to leave, but it's pretty rare. Uh, but they also control their water. They control their supplies. They control their, their internet connection. They control their food. They literally, back in 2007, said they were putting the Palestinians, quote unquote, on a diet and decreased the amount of calories to under the amount that they thought was a livable level of calories allowed into the Gaza area. So it's, of course, it's occupied. <laughs> Uh, the next point that he brings up is why did Hamas kidnap more than 200 innocent Israeli civilians? Now, again, Lee, this is something that you've brought up. The fact that there are um, there are 1,200, there are thousands actually of detainees, of prisoners, of Palestinian prisoners. And he brings up that 1,200 of them, it, it's probably more. Yeah, these are old numbers. Yeah. Uh, are administrative detainees, so-called, which means they are held indefinitely with no trial or charge. This is kidnapping and also illegal under international law. But hey, right. who's keeping track? Right. And then he says that they've Israel has kidnapped 1,500 more since October 7th. But that actually is now over 5,000. Right. And so what he points out here is that we may assume that Hamas took Israelis as prisoners to exchange them. But also... This is, this is, this, again, this is like this whataboutism. It's like, well, what about the Israeli civilian prisoners? I agree. It's awful. Are we also talking about how awful it is that there are thousands, including children, uh, Palestinians that are kept in Israeli prisons? Are we also talking about that? Because if we're not, then we can't actually have a conversation about this. Right. And how much of this was in the news? You're hearing a lot about the the hostages Hamas has right now, right? You hear about it all the time. You hear it on the news. You see their faces often. People are putting up posters of them. How much did you hear about the hostages Israel had before October 7th? How much did you hear CNN talk about it? How much did you see a poster of the 5,000 people that were locked up in Israeli jails without given uh, access to a trial or charges. And then even if they are given a trial, it's uh, an Israeli judge saying guilty because you're Palestinian. So how much did you hear about them? Zero mm -hmm. ever. So there's a difference. Right. Uh, so now on to the talking points about the larger issue in general. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a complex issue that's hard to understand and even harder to solve. This is one that 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 has been, I mean, th this is propaganda that's been happening since day one. Uh, it's complex. Right. Well, Eleanor, why, why are we talking about it when it's so complex? This is, interestingly enough, you see this happen with pretty much every issue, including climate change. You'll see them up there like, well, I'm not a scientist, so I don't really understand. And it's like, no, you're not. You're an idiot. And you should listen to the scientists because they all agree. Just like with this issue, actually, it's not complex. And all the people who are experts on the issue, the UN, uh, human rights organizations, they're all very clear on this. Israel is a settler colonial state, and this is very clear cut. Uh, it's illegal according to international law. It's uh, human rights violations daily. Uh, there's really no complexity here. The only thing that's complex is how it's fed to us and how it's fed to us via propaganda. And a lot of this... It's used to shut down debate, is to say it's complex. A lot of this has to do with the next point, which is Jewish people have existed in the land long before Palestinians, making them its rightful owners. So two things here. Not long before. In conjunction with. So that's the other thing. Yes, there are Jewish people. Uh, they're oftentimes referred to as Mizrahi Jews, who have been in that area, that land, and interestingly enough, they were typically called Sephardic Jews before the advent of Israel, uh, that have existed on the land that is now called Israel for thousands of years. Absolutely. You know what? They lived in Palestine. <laughs> Palestine, uh, being the unfortunate homeland of three different religions, has had people that are Christian, Muslim and Jews, and let's not forget there are a lot of Palestinian Christians as well. Uh, we all just kind of assume that they're all these uh, these evil Muslims, right? 
Um, but these three, uh, th these three religious uh, groups have existed in what is now occupied Palestine for thousands of years. Absolutely. And they coexisted a lot. And there have been waves of migration of Jews, particularly like in the late 1800s, fleeing the pogroms in Europe. And then a lot who didn't migrate there because they didn't want to or they couldn't. And guess what? There was another time they had to get on a big boat because everything flooded. <laughs> Things have been weird. So I thought that was just giraffes. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, yes. And then the, the, this, this, this point is that uh, the next point is the Jewish people deserve their own safe homeland in direct response to the Holocaust. Uh, now, a lot of people make this argument, and this is one in, in particular that, that gets difficult with, um, with Jewish families, uh, but there are so many histories, unfortunately, of genocide and oppression of many people, Jews being one of them, Jews being one of them. <laughs> we all deserve a safe homeland. But that homeland cannot be at the expense of other people's genocide. And in reality, Jews, just like everyone else, should be at home wherever they want to be at home. Again, not at the expense of anybody else. So I have the right as a Jewish person to feel safe in the United States as a human being, right? And so this makes no sense. Yes, we deserve to feel safe after the Holocaust. But the other thing is you can't find safety in the genocide of others. There's no such thing. You make everybody less safe by committing genocide. So finally here, Israel has consistently made generous peace offers, which were rejected by the Palestinians. That is just the biggest load of bullshit I've heard in a long time. <laughs> um, it's, it's totally not true. So, uh, and there is like so much written about this. Again, I'm not going to read all of these, um, all of these uh, slides. Y'all can check it out on your own, but that is just bullshit. And well, and they would also, as you mentioned the Oslo agreement earlier, and they would make these agreements and then just to totally ignore them. So yeah, it's, it's insane. what settler colonials do, right? You see that in the United States. Where we have we stuck these, by every deal we've ever made. We're like, what are you talking Every time about? there's a pipeline or every time there's a mining project, the, the, the indigenous people come with like, the Treaty of 18 so and so says you can't do this. And the US government is like, yeah, we don't give a shit. That's just not a. Yeah. Thing. Or something we signed like five years ago says you can't. And it's like, oh, no, we don't care anymore. Like the Minsk uh, agreements with between Ukraine and Russia. And They've now admitted Zelensky and others and Germany admitted that they signed those because they never intended to keep to them. They just wanted to uh, buy time to arm Ukraine more heavily. So they signed them and never intended to keep to them, which same as U.S. signing stuff with the Native Americans. 